Okay? Yeah. My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands. to another service online with St Peter's, Carlton Colville and St Andrew's Mutford. As usual, my name's Mark Ellis. I'm the reader at these two churches. You're welcome to this morning service of morning prayer. And thank you for inviting us into your home. If you're watching last Sunday, then I do apologise profusely that um, we appear to muted ourselves halfway through that service. Hopefully we'll get away with it this week. We are now running two services every Sunday, one online and one over at St. Peter's, Carlton Colville. It's a lot of work and so what I'm cunning plan I've got now is that the service that we do online will largely reflect the service that will take place at St. Peter's. 
So again, this Sunday, we'll have morning prayer here and at St. Peter's. We'll try and use the same songs and hymns. At St. Peter's, we often do something special when it's a fifth Sunday, something unusual. In the past, we've done Teze services or cafe church. Uh, next Sunday, I think we'll have some more modern worship from Spring Harvest. So if that's your, your flavour, then do come to either of those two services in real or online. So let's prepare ourselves for this service of morning prayer. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image. To the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and redeemer of all. To you be glory and praise for ever. From the waters of chaos you drew forth the world, and in your great love fashioned us in your image. Now, through the deep waters of death, you have brought your people to new birth by raising your Son to life in triumph. May Christ your light ever dawn in our hearts as we offer you our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will guides my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on His pure delights, and I will Trust in you alone, and 
has passed and the day lies open before us let us pray with one heart and mind as we rejoice in the gift of this new day so may the light of your presence O God set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever Amen. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same functions, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, help, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do so cheerfully. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? But he 
Good morning, everybody. The reading today is taken from Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, hey. 
Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. You have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, and Christ shall give you light. When Christ our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Well, as you can see from the shadows around here, I'm re <coughs> recording this uh, early on Thursday morning, so the shadows are a bit weird, and they're going to move very quickly. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We are, of course, the church of St. Peter here in Carlton Colville. So it's appropriate then that we should spend a little bit of time just looking at what this is all about. And do excuse that cat's tail that's coming in here. Um, he's just been diagnosed with diabetes, so he's on a course of insulin and he's just starting to pick up quite nicely very distracting isn't it I'm so sorry but that passage this morning has given rise to all those little cartoons and jokes about Peter sitting there at the pearly gates with the keys of heaven letting those in and those out <clears throat> But before we look a bit at uh, Peter's role, we need to backtrack. Because Jesus tells Peter that he is the rock on which Jesus will build his church. And the question here is, did Jesus really intend to found a church? Someone famously said that Jesus preached the kingdom and it was the church that came instead. Matthew's Gospel alone of the Gospels makes a direct reference to the church, twice using the word ecclesia. And so it's been dubbed the ecclesiastical gospel. Uh, it's the gospel most loved by Roman Catholics because of that emphasis on the church and on discipline and on order. But some argue that if Jesus was expecting the oncoming of the kingdom in his lifetime, and after all, the kingdom of heaven is like this, is what Matthew's gospel is all about, there'd be no need for a church. And that accounts for the paucity of allusions to a church in any of the other gospels. As we've said before, Mark is a very much an eyewitness type gospel. 
Uh, he probably never even thought of a church as such. But by at least the time that Matthew writes his gospel, and again, we've often talked about the idea that Matthew uses lots of stuff from Mark. But by the time Matthew writes his gospel, Matthew's convinced of the necessity for a church in the purpose of God. And the church envisaged by Matthew, of course, is very different from the great, bulky, bureaucratic hippopotamus figure, apparently as T.S. Eliot once called her, a hippopotamus. I'd never thought of the church as a hippopotamus, but never mind, perhaps that's true. I'm going to have to just put up with this cat, look, there you go. See, Mark Capron has a chicken, I have a cat to sort it out. But it's very different from the church that we know today. If Peter's a rock, then the church becomes living stones. It's not a building, but it's an assembly. It's not a thing, but it's an event. It's not a place just to visit, but it's a community to belong to. The community gathers around Jesus, and to Matthew, Jesus matters decisively. The promise Jesus makes is that the church will endure and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, this may seem unlikely, of course, in the face of the decline of church attendance in the UK. But we need to understand that it's not a claim for the numerical size of the church. Not that St Peter's, our church, will continue unchanged. We do go up, we do go down, and perhaps we are going down in numbers. But, I think as we've always thought at St Peter's, it's a claim that the living stones that gather faithfully around Jesus will remain the witness of God to the world. But of course Peter in this passage this morning, is then entrusted with a responsible role in this new ecclesia. I often get so impressed or so encouraged by Peter's entrustment here, and yet he's still the guy that's going to deny Jesus. It was three times later on. But Peter is the gatekeeper who holds the keys. His authority, though, is not, though, for the afterlife. But for the oversight of an infant church, he holds the keys to an infant church. So the keys are not to the gate to control admission, but to the storehouse to enable him to make provision for the household. Peter isn't there to block access, despite all those little cartoons. And so, far from excluding people, it was he, Peter, who felt God's pressure to open the gates to the Gentiles, as we find out in Acts. But as well as keys, there's that image of rope, the bounding, or the binding. And it's not for tying people up in this case, nor need it be about the right to forgive sins. It's most likely to be about issues being tied up or loosed. If you read the passage before, Jesus is hitting against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and actually uses the word yeast there. And I do wonder whether there's a tie up there to loosen, not to tie up, to loosen. Peter's being trusted to know when to constrain people and when to let them go. When to shape the church along well-worn paths but when also to set it free, to explore boundless possibilities in the life of the Spirit unleashed, a church unleashed, an Acts church unleashed there. The decisions taken by Peter were not just underwritten though by heaven. Peter is promised divine guidance so that decisions taken are in accordance with decisions already made in heaven. 
Now, we've come a long way in 2,000 years and the one church that Peter was entrusted with has, of course, been divided by Eastern Orthodox, Western Orthodox, Western Orthodox splits again, splits again, splits again, splits again. And our deep divisions in the church come down to binding and loosing those very things that Peter is given responsibility for. I mean, one group will argue that the church is doing too much binding, that we're expecting people to believe and to live in a certain way that's not appropriate, perhaps, for the 21st century anymore. But others will claim that the church is doing too much loosing and that it's time that people were bound to more rigid beliefs and conduct. The answer to that issue relates to the purpose for the church and especially to who Jesus is. The purpose of the church and especially to who Jesus is. Who do you say that I am? Peter trots out a formulaic reply. You are the Christ. But we have to answer each of us for ourselves there. If Jesus was to ask you, who do you say that I am? One answer given by a church leader, though, sounds refreshing and accurate. You are the epicentre of the universe, the purpose of creation, the meaning of existence, the bond that joins humanity to God forever. It's our vocation, our own each vocation, to say who we believe Christ is. It's our church's vocation to help us to learn and know who Jesus is. And then to provide the safe place, the safe space, where we can practice voicing our convictions and hammering out our beliefs. We're going to pray later about safeguarding. It becomes bigger and bigger, but what if the church was, is, and really should be the safe place? where we can practice voicing our convictions and hammering out our beliefs. What if? And we do so in the assurance that the church will not cease until the gospel is known in all the world. Amen. We join together in the words of the Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In 1 Corinthians, Chapter 3, Paul writes, We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's, God's building. Let us pray together. Lord, we look forward to the appointment of our priest in charge at St Peter's and St Andrew's, that shepherd to lead us forward in faith and outreach. We give thanks and pray for the appointment of Sharon Brown, our new children and young people's safeguarding officer, and giving thanks for the loyal service of Elizabeth in this role. We pray for Bob in his roles both as church warden and safeguarding officer for vulnerable adults. Bless and guide him in his tasks. And we pray for Angie as she coordinates safeguarding in groups. 
bless and guide and give vision to all of our PCC members, giving thanks for their faithful service. And we, we pray that each one of us may be your living stones. Lord, in your mercy, hear wow. our prayer. We pray for Boris Johnson, his cabinet ministers and all members of parliament in adopting policies that are fair to all and in eradicating discrimination of any kind, whether on the basis of status, location, disability, sex or race. We particularly pray for wisdom and compassion in dealing with asylum seekers, taking desperate, life-threatening measures to reach our shores, each one a human being created in your image. You know from where each has come. Praying for all those living in tents, hoping to cross the channel. Lord, please shine your light into the whole situation. And we pray that your will may be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Lebanon, living with the aftermath of the horrendous explosion. Comfort all who mourn, strengthen and guide all those bringing aid of any kind, and give hope for the future there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of Belarus for an end to brutality and torture at the hands of the police. Lord, we pray for justice for that country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for comfort for all those suffering from coronavirus across the world, for strength and guidance for doctors, nurses and carers, and for wisdom for those seeking develop, to develop vaccines. We particularly pray for those countries struggling to cope and tackling poverty. For Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, occupied Palestine, the refugee camps, and Yemen in the fight against malnourishment. Lord, the lift seems endless, but through you, all things are possible. Lord, make haste to bring all the, those aid to those most in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, Lord, we bring before you all who are sick, in body, mind or spirit, praying particularly for all those who are anxious or struggling mentally at this time. We lift you, those in our fellowship and those on our hearts, before you. Lord, may your healing, loving hand be upon them. Lord of heaven and earth, as Jesus taught his disciples to be persistent in prayer, give us patience and courage never to lose hope. Lord, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now can we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we close this service. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.